sins I have abandoned right and claim to heaven above whether saints rejoice for ever in a boundless sea of love Jesus Lord I ask for mercy let me not implore in vain all of my sins I now detest them never will I sin again Lord our God, you who created the heaven and the earth and all that they contain, come for your gift of endless praise and thanksgiving. This is the day we begin this long but short journey of length by which we testify that your death means nothing to us but invitation to share in your death and resurrection. We thank you that you revealed your mercy to us and revealing your mercy to us, you revealed your might. May we walk in your suffering so that you'll be ready to evangelize by what you say and do in doing as people who evangelize, we share in your death and resurrection until you come again. Mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, you followed Jesus through his suffering and ended up in his death. Through faith, we have become your brothers and sisters of the resurrection. We ask you, who sent your son in his death and resurrection to give the fullness of their spirit to all humanity, in the church and in the world, forever and ever, amen. Good evening viewers and welcome this Ash Wednesday to our maiden edition of the Lenten Catechesis my name is Father Michael Mensah, and I'm very happy to bring you this edition on behalf of the Archbishop, Most Reverend John Bonaventure Kofi. Our intention is to do four episodes of Catechesis, beginning today, Ash Wednesday. The first one being Lent, a time of prayer, this first edition. The second one on fasting, and we shall call that the fast that pleases God. The third edition will be Why must I confess my sins? So that would be a teaching on penance and reconciliation. And the fourth episode will be preparing to celebrate Holy Week. So we shall have that just before Holy Week. So let's begin our catechesis tonight by speaking about Lent. So let's introduce ourselves to Lent. What is Lent? Um, we will begin looking at what is Lent then we shall go on to look at the significance of the 40 days. So we know that Lent spans a period of 40 days. We shall look at what 40 days means in the Bible. Then we shall concern ourselves also with the question of ashes. 
So for instance, today is Ash Wednesday. You can see my ashes on my forehead. Uh, why, why should we impose ashes on our foreheads in Lent? Then we shall go on to look at the three Lenten practices of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. We shall introduce ourselves to those concepts briefly. And then finally, we shall conclude on our main topic for today, which is prayer in the season of Lent. So today we shall focus on one of those practices, which is the question of prayer. So let's begin right away and ask the question, what then is Lent? Now, the Lenten season is a time of preparation for the liturgical celebration of the suffering, death, and resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we know it is a 40-day period, beginning from Ash Wednesday, which is today, until the evening of Holy Thursday, that is, within Holy Week. And these 40 days actually exclude Sundays of Lent. So when we are counting the 40 days of Lent, we do not include the Sundays during the season of Lent. Now, let's begin by asking ourselves then, why 40 days? In actual fact, um, if you opened a Latin missal, you will actually not find the word Lent. What you will find is quadragesima. That is the word in Latin for Lent. Now, what is the difference? In actual fact, Lent is an Anglo-Saxon word, uh, lengthen. And what it actually means, uh, translated into modern-day English, is spring. So it has to do with the fact that around this time, let's say March in Europe, uh, what happens is that um, the first rains begin to fall or the snow begins to melt. And from that, you have the young, tender grass, you know, and lilies beginning to blossom. So it's springtime. And that is where we get the word Lent from. But in actual fact, in the Latin, from the Latin tradition, the word is quadragesima, which means 40. So in, in, real, in real terms, the, the, the Roman church or the Latin church's understanding of Lent has to do more with the question of the 40. So why 40? Now, to be able to understand uh, the number 40, we need to delve back into the Bible because uh, in the Bible, numbers have meaning. Uh, for instance, the number one is the number for God, the one who is indivisible. Uh, there is only one God. If you read from Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, 4 and 5, um, 2 is the number of witness. 3 is the number of the thrice holy God. Holy, holy, holy is the reason why Jesus is in the tomb for three days and three nights and so on and so forth. But 4 is the earthly number. 4 is the number of the earth. That is why we have, for instance, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And that is the reason why we have uh, the four cardinal points, east, west, north, and south. And so in the Bible, four is an earthly number. But you begin to see that as we read through the Bible, especially from the book of Genesis, we begin to see four and 40 take on a very interesting significance. So for instance, in the book of Genesis, you're reading from Genesis chapter 7 and reading from verse 4, you find the story of Noah's flood. Um, in fact, th this passage says, And I will bring rain down on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and so I will wipe out from the surface of the earth every moving creature that I have made. This is Genesis chapter 7, verse 4. You can also read Genesis chapter 8, verses 5 through 6. So uh, Noah's flood lasts for 40 days, and you can see it was a time of cleansing uh, of, of sin and evil because man had become... Um, increasingly wicked, as it were. So God wanted to cleanse the face of the earth. So the number 40, you can see, associated with cleansing, with, you know, um, washing sins away, and so on and so forth. You can also read from the book of Exodus, chapter 34, and reading from verse 28, uh, when Moses goes up the mountain of Sinai, the mountain of Horeb, to fast, uh, where he receives the law. And, and you read, it says, so Moses stayed there, with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights without eating any food or drinking any water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So again, there we have it. 
Moses goes up the mountain of Sinai. God gives him the tablets of the Ten Commandments. He fasts for 40 days and 40 nights up on the mountain, and God reveals the word to him. So what is 40 days and 40 again? 40 is the number of waiting upon God. It is the number of listening to his word, uh, and so on and so forth. So again, there we have the significance of the number 40. But we can continue our search in the scripture. Again, you will find that uh, Israel is in the wilderness when they came out of, of, of Egypt and they were in the wilderness of Sinai heading towards the promised land. How long were they in the wilderness of Sinai? They were in the wilderness again for 40 years. So it says, if you read from Joshua chapter 5 verse 6, it says, now the Israelites had wandered 40 years in the desert until all the warriors among the people that came forth from Egypt died off because they had not obeyed the command of the Lord. Or again, you can see Numbers chapter 32 verse 13. So these passages all speak about how long Israel was in the wilderness of Sinai. 40 years. So what is again that 40 years was the meaning of 40? 40 here means a time of journeying. It's a time of trial. It's even a time of temptation. Remember that uh, in, the, in the desert, there, there was a time they had no food there, and God gave them manna. There was a time that they had no water and Moses had to strike the rock at Meribah for them to have water. So again, it was a time of trial, of, you know, of hardship, of temptation, and so on and so forth. So again, there we have another biblical significance of the number 40. There are other references that we could look at. For instance, we could look also in the book of Kings. So this is 1 Kings chapter 19, reading from verse 8. Elijah is in the desert. Again, if you read this passage, it says, he got up, Elijah got up and drank, and then strengthened by that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain of God, Horeb. So Elijah actually does exactly what Moses had done. Moses went up to the mountain of Sinai, which is the same as the mountain of Horeb. Uh, he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. And here we can see also Elijah, the prophet, who wants to restore. He wants to restore the covenant that God made with his people, Israel. He wants to restore that covenant. And therefore, he makes a 40-day journey in the wilderness. And the only food that he has is the food that God provides through a raven and so on and so forth. So, um, again, Elijah in the desert, um, 40 days uh, and 40 nights. But even if we went through the historical books and went even into the prophetic books, we find another favorite passage of scripture which we all know, which we often will read in the season of Lent, the story of the prophet Jonah. Remember Jonah? Uh, who was sent by God to go and preach in Nineveh. He refused. He went to uh, somewhere else, to Tarshish, but God brought him back through that, um, that fish that swallowed him, and he had to go to Nineveh. And what does it say in Jonah chapter 3, 4 and 5? When Jonah goes to preach in Nineveh, what's, what, what, what does the word of God say? It says, Jonah began his journey through the city. This is the city of Nineveh. And he had gone but a single day's walk, announcing... Forty days more and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And when the people of Nineveh believed God, they proclaimed a fast, all of them great and small, and put on sackcloth. So here it is. Um, Jonah's message to the people of Nineveh, Forty days more and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And so the number 40 there was associated with this period of fasting, this period of repentance, this um, period of self-abnegation, uh, self-humiliation before God, so that God would not bring the wrath that he had threatened upon the people of Nineveh. So again, the number 40, a number of penitence, a number of repentance, and so on and so forth. And that really is the reason why when we read now in the gospel, for instance, in Mark's gospel, chapter 1, uh, 12 to 14, that Jesus uh, went into the desert and, and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights without eating anything. Uh, it, it recalls, it brings back all these 
images that we've seen in the Old Testament. It brings back the story of Noah. This is the story of cleansing. It brings back the story of Moses. This is the story of listening to God's word. It brings back the story of um, the whole of Israel, the people going through the desert, headed towards the promised land, seeking for God's renewal, um, and so on and so forth. It brings back Elijah making this pilgrimage to repeat what Moses had done. It brings back the story of, um, of Jonah, you know, and, and his, his, um, his preaching in, in Nineveh, calling the people to repentance and to a change of life. So, again, like I said, in Mark chapter 1, 12 and following, it says, The Spirit drove Jesus out into the desert, and he remained in the desert for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was among wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. So, you can see 40 is uh, a biblical number, and it is um, so rich in significance. Uh, it means testing, because if you remember, uh, the people of Israel were in the, in the desert and they were tested, as, as it were, uh, by God, their faith. It's, it's a number of trial, um, because they were in that place where there was no water, there was no food. It's a, it's a number of penance, because as you can see, uh, Jonah uh, preached and the people of Nineveh would abnegate themselves. They would wear sackcloth and ashes. Uh, they would be sorry for their sins and therefore it is a number of penance it's a number of purification purification because remember the story of noah and the flood for 40 days and 40 nights that purifies the face of the earth and and um, and rids the earth of all that is evil it is a number of renewal because god is beginning something new they cleanse he cleanses the earth in the days of noah and he renews the face of the earth. So, 40, a very significant biblical number, very important. And that is why um, the church calls the season of Lent the quadragesima, the 40th, so that we can relive all these rich biblical experiences of testing, of trial, of penance, of purification, of renewal, all these things we can do in the season of Lent. Now, the third dimension of our catechesis tonight is the question of ashes. And I said, you can look at my forehead and you can see my ashes. I went to Mass this morning. I've received my ashes. And probably uh, someone might have met you after Mass and asked you, well, why, why do you have ashes on your forehead? What is the significance of these ashes? Is it in the Bible? Um, why should we impose ashes upon ourselves? So that is something that we can also have a conversation around. Well, what we can say to begin with is, where do we find the ashes that you know, we sign ourselves with on Ash Wednesday? Well, practically, these ashes are from the palm fronds, which you used on Palm Sunday last year. So last year, you, uh, we had Palm Sunday, you had your palm fronds, you went around with a Hosiana, you know, singing and so on, on Palm Sunday or Passion Sunday last year. What the priest did, what Father did, was to gather these palm fronds, which you used last year. He kept them for a whole year. And before Ash Wednesday, he burns these ashes, which you, uh, these palm, you know, dried palm fronds, which you used last year, burns them. And when they burn them, they become this gray, dark ash, you know. And, and that, those are the ashes. And on Ash Wednesday, at the, um, during the Mass, the priest will then bless these ashes. And these ashes will then be imposed, usually uh, with the sign of the cross, on your forehead, on my forehead. And, and usually, they will be accompanied by words such as, Remember that you are dust and into dust you shall return. So the priest will say this as he's signing your forehead with these ashes. Or he might say, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. So then we can ask ourselves again, um, what is the biblical significance of ashes? Where do we get this, um, this practice of, of signing ourselves with ashes? Is it biblical? 
Well, let's go through the Bible a bit and let's try to see some of the passages in the Bible that speak about ashes. So, first and foremost, we can go again into the book of Genesis. So, this is Genesis chapter 18 and reading from verse 27. It says something very interesting. In fact, this is the story about how Abraham was interceding with God on behalf of um, the people of Sodom so that he, you know, he was going to destroy, God was going to destroy the city and um, Abraham would intercede on behalf of these people. And Abraham would say something very interesting to God. He would say, um, Behold, I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. I who am but dust and ashes. This is Genesis chapter 18, verse 27. So we find um, this reference of somebody referring to himself as dust and ashes. What, it, what does it mean? It simply means that I am a mortal being. If you remember in uh, the book of Genesis chapter 2, reading from verses 7 and following, when God was creating man, it says that he took dust from the earth, he formed man and he breathed, he breathed into him the breath of life. So man, what is man made of? Man is really made of dust and ashes. So put, to put ashes on ourselves is to express that we are mere mortals. You know, um, in fact, the psalmist says, teach us to number our days aright so that we may have wisdom of heart. So to put ashes on ourselves is to remind us that we are frail, we are mortal, and that, you know, um, we, we, we're made from dust as God created us in Genesis chapter 2 and into dust one day we shall return. So that's the first significance of ashes. But there are others. Um, for instance, we can read, for instance, the book of Esther. So the book of Esther um, this book which is, tells the story about the Jews when they were in Persia. And um, in this book, we shall read about a man who was trying to exterminate, was trying to kill all the Jews. And there was a very pious Jew called Mordecai, uh, whose, um, um, let's say his daughter, you know, was married to the Persian king. And when he had the news that all Jews were supposed to be exterminated, wiped out from the face of the earth. Um, let's listen to his reaction. This is in the book of Esther chapter 4, reading from verses 1 to 3. It says, When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai rent his clothes. He tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, wailing with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. So what does it really mean? Um, it means that in the Bible, when somebody is in a period of real difficulty, a period of real trial, and, and is really calling out to God, you know, with all their strength and with all their might. This is a matter of life and death. Um, one way of signifying their abnegation, self-abnegation, the fact that they are really serious in prayer, was to put themselves in sackcloth and in ashes. And we can see this from the book of Esther. So uh, this is one example of what happens um, in, in this book. Again, we shall see when Job repents, uh, in Job chapter 42, verses 4 and 5, it says, Job says to God, I had heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees thee, and therefore I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Again, you read from um, Jonah, uh, again from the book of Jonah, this is Jonah chapter 3, 6 to 7, it says, then the tidings reached the king of Nineveh, Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he made a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. So, again, in the city of Nineveh, um, Sorrow for sin, repentance, conversion was done with sackcloth and ashes. And that is why in the season of Lent, which is a great season of repentance, uh, if we want to express our repentance, we do so also um, by 
imposing on ourselves sackcloth and ashes. Um, so these are some of the things uh, that um, ashes signify. So ashes signify that life is transient, it is fleeting, life is passing away, but it's also a symbol of purity. Remember the palm that goes into the fire, it's it's, it's burned and, and it's purified and so on and so forth. So that is what um, this means. Now, in the season of Lent, there are three main things that we are called to do. And I'm sure that if you went to Mass today, you would hear from Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 6, the invitation to prayer. First and foremost, prayer. The second one is fasting. And the third one is almsgiving. Why should we pray? We should pray so that we are able to renew our relationship with God. Why should we give alms? We should give alms so that we are able to renew our relationship with our neighbor by giving the person something, by giving the person food, and so on and so forth. And why should we fast? We should fast so that we are able to rein in our desires, and that we are able to therefore renew the relationship that we have with the things that God has created. Food, drink, and so on and so forth. So prayer will restore our relationship with God. Almsgiving will restore our relationship with our neighbor. Fasting will restore our relationship with the things that God has created. And today, we just want to remind ourselves of some of the ways in which we can pray during the season of Lent. First and foremost... Let's remember, Lent is the time for personal prayer. Lent is the time when we should go back to our quiet time, seek to pray quietly every day, make our time to commune with Jesus. But Lent is also a time of liturgical prayer. Lent is the time when you want to go for Mass. Um, it is the time when you don't only seek to go for Mass, maybe only on Sundays, but even on weekdays. It's a time when you want to observe the holy days of obligation, Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, and so on and so forth. Lent is also a time for communal devotions. Lent is a time, for instance, where you want to do the way of the cross. Stations of the cross on Fridays. Join with the parish community and do that. It's a time also of communal devotions where you, want to, you don't want to miss going to the grotto to pray with other people. What other type of prayer are we talking about? It's a time of Lectio Divina, of listening to the Word of God, of meditative prayer. This is the time in Lent to pray with the Bible. Open the Bible, meditate on it, pray with the Word of God. Lent is also the time to pray with the Psalms. Take your Bible, open a beautiful Psalm like Psalm 51 or Psalm 139 and pray. Or Psalm 23, your favorite Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Lent is the time of family prayer. There's a time when you want to pray with your family. So that if it is not a practice in your family, this is the time to gather the family around and pray with the family. Lent is the time of days of prayer. This is the time when you want to go to Kodiabe, to the Catechetical Center with your parish on retreat, on recollection, or to go to Sol Pond if you wish. But to go to a place of pilgrimage. Take a day off, two days off for prayer. It's a time of days of prayer. It is a time of adoration. This is the time, for instance, you want to visit the Blessed Sacrament. Okay, um, So go to the Blessed Sacrament quietly, adore the Lord, speak to the Lord, um, and, and have that personal commune with the Lord. It is also the time where you don't only want to pray, let's say, in the morning, but you want to sanctify the hours of the day. So is the t this Lent is the time when you want to remember your angelus, is a time when during the day you can say what we call short prayers or ejaculatory prayers during the day. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Let prayer continue. As Paul says in the letter to Thessalonians, chapter 5, he says, pray without ceasing. So this is the time learned to continually breathe and eat prayer. Um, and finally, let's, let's just wrap up um, what we've been saying with a few thoughts from Pope Francis. Pope Francis says Lent is a time of journeying together, like the apostles um, going up the Mount of the Transfiguration, walking with Jesus up that mountain, Peter, James, and John. It's a time when we must keep our eyes fixed on the path, even as we climb up. It is a time when we must listen to Jesus. And it's the time when, 
our goal is to be transformed and to be transfigured. So what is Lent? This is what Lent is about. Lent is a time of great renewal. It's a time when we are heading towards Easter. We want to renew our church. We want to renew ourselves. So what have we learned today? Today we have learned, first and foremost, what Lent is. It is that period of spiritual preparation preparing us to celebrate Easter. We've also asked the question, why 40 days? 40 because 40 is a very significant number in the Bible. It is the number of trial, it is the number of preparation, it is the number of testing, and so on and so forth. We've asked the question, why ashes? Ashes signify repentance, penitence, humility before God, conversion, and so on and so forth. We've also looked at the three Lenten practices. What are the three most important Lenten practices? Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And finally, we've concluded on prayer in the season of Lent. And we've suggested a number of things that you can do during the season of Lent. Remember, Lent is a time for your personal prayer, is a time for communal prayer and devotion, is a time for liturgical prayer, is a time for days taken off in prayer, it is a time for silent adoration. It is a time for reading the Word of God, the Lexio Divina. Get back to the Word of God. Whatever you do, make time throughout the day, sanctify the day with prayer. That is what we have looked at. And I'd like to invite you to also join us in our next episode, which will be on the question of fasting. What type of fast is it that pleases God? That will be in our next episode. Once again, God bless you.